Good morning. Um, I've got lots of notices, so many that I've had to make myself a list. So listen hard. The newsletter's gone out this morning, so there's lots of things on there for you to read this afternoon. Notices there about the next few weeks. Um, a special thing that's going to happen in the next few weeks is the pancake party on the 1st of March, and we still need some volunteers for that. Um, that's a case of um, letting um, Kaylee know. Um, Helen has asked me to remind you that there are cards for sale, cards that the craft group make, and they're in the coffee lounge. So as we don't go through there, um, they are not really going at the moment, but that is raising funds for Christ Hope. Yeah. So that's the cards. Now, the coffee rota, um, we have coffee today, thanks to Sheila and Guy. And Carol has said that we need another two couples to make it into a, a nice five month rotation. So next week, we haven't got anybody. Um, if there's anybody else who would like to join that rota, please speak to Carol. It's not a difficult task, especially as it's only once every five months. That's right, isn't it, Carol? That's right, every five months. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, two more couples needed, at least, because if, um, if we get more than two, then great. Uh, today we've got Charles preaching. Lovely. It's been quite a long time, Charles. We're looking forward to it. <laughs> And next week, it's John. <laughs> all, all the usual things this week with house groups and um, toddlers, craft club, coffee break and Jays. Um, prayer meeting on Zoom on Thursday mornings. More people would be very welcome to join that. And um, that's, that's all of the things happening this week. Uh, we had an answered prayer yesterday. Uh, we were praying for Tim, who had a blackout and a fall down the stairs. Um, he spent the day at the hospital, but he is now home. And um, James, do you want to fill us in a bit? Yeah, yeah come here. Right. So, so we discovered yesterday about lunchtime that Tim had uh, experienced a spell of dizziness um, and fallen down the stairs and been taken to A&E by ambulance at 9.30, uh, Kaylee's request. Um, and she hadn't heard anything from him for most of the, uh, quite a while. Um, so we, we, were, we were tracking it yesterday um, and then the deacon started praying. Um, and the latest news that we've got um, as of this morning um, when, well, Kaylee went and picked him up last night, um, but when we started praying, then, uh, then things seemed to start, to start happening in the hospital, um, and he's being diagnosed with cluster migraines, um, and uh, his x-ray of his shoulder, where he fell down the stairs, um, has come back clear, um, and apparently it's the sort of thing that might happen again, <laughs> which is not great. Um, having a dizziness spell and falling over, but so it's, it's a subject for ongoing prayer, I think. But when things start, when we started praying, then things started happening at hospital after we'd been in there for six hours. Praise God for that one. Thank you, James. And is it over to Charles or Pauline? Pauline. Good morning, everybody. It's so lovely to be able to gather, as Chas was praying with worship group earlier on, it's so nice to be able to come into church and gather and be together, and it's also nice to have the privilege to lead you in worship this morning, the first time in a very, very long time. So, This morning when Chas brings God's word, we're going to be looking at the Beatitudes, and one of the commentaries that I looked at that just sort of encapsulated what the Beatitudes meant, it just simply had one statement that it said, the Beatitudes are declarations of God's grace. 
because when we look at the Beatitudes later with Chaz, they all start with blessed are the, blessed are the. And we are all truly blessed. And God's blessing to each one of us is that declaration of grace. So I'd like to start by reading to you Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the people praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples justly, and you guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. Then the land will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. So as we think of God's grace to each one of us, God's blessing or blessings that he showers upon us day by day. If the team would like to gather, I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing, great is your faithfulness, your grace is enough. Peace. 
Heavenly God, we thank you that we can gather this morning. And as it says in that psalm, as your people, we can praise you. Lord God, we come. We come to praise you, to give you thanks, to give you the glory that you deserve. Father, we thank you for your gift of grace, for the blessings that you pour out on each one of us day by day. Lord God, help us to remember that your grace is enough, that you give us the strength for each day. Father God, may our praise and worship be acceptable to you in this place this morning. Amen. Okay, if you'd like to be seated. Is that okay? Yeah. Right. Question for you. Who can ride a bike? Oh, quite a lot of you. You notice I'm not putting my hand up because I can't. <clears throat> anyway, that's another story. But right. So lots of you put your hands up. You can ride bikes. Brilliant. The very first time you got on a bike, could you ride it? What happened? You fell off. Uh, you fell off oh so nearly everybody that you didn't oh did you have those little wheels on the back to help you yeah see I think I'd probably still need those you've been practicing that's the point isn't it because oh Oh, well, that means then I, oh, I'll have to practice doubly hard then, won't I? I've just been told that you can only get those little wheels on children's bikes. You can't get them on an adult's bike. So that means I still can't ride a bike at the moment. But the point is, you, all of you that put your hand up and said, yes, yes, I can ride a bike. Then you all admitted that, yeah, the first time I got on the bike, I fell off. So you had to learn to ride the bike, yes? Yeah? So you might have had the little stabilizers on the back. And then once you started to get your balance and you knew what you was doing, you know, pushing the pedals around and things like that, maybe then the stabilizers got taken off. And then maybe you had to then think about your balance a little bit more. Maybe an adult held the back of the saddle, yeah? Exactly, you see, yep. You've seen me try to ride a bike, haven't you? That is exactly me. Yeah, you take the wheels off and then you try to pedal and then maybe somebody's holding the back of the saddle and then you think, yes, I've got it. And you start pedaling along. You look behind, see that mum, dad or the adult has let go of the saddle and it's way crash, right? Do you give up or do you get back on and you practice and you practice? You get back on, don't you? And you practice and you practice. And eventually then all of you that have put your hand up to say you can ride a bike. Now you can see a bike. You think going on a bike ride. You get on the bike and off you go. Yeah. You don't in some respects necessarily think about what you've got to do, do you, to ride a bike? I'm assuming those of you that do ride a bike, I'm assuming you don't think, right, there's the bike, right, I'll get on the saddle, right, I've got to hold the handlebars, I've got to put the pedal up, I've got to push the pedal down, I've got to pump my legs up. You don't do all of that, do you? You just get on the bike and off you go. Yeah? Exactly. You can ride your bike really fast. I'm sure there's lots of people here that can go really fast, can't they? Especially Gary and those sort of people, yeah, or so I've been told, you know, woof, off you've gone. The point is, it's because Well, that, but that's the point, you see, that's the whole point you've been practicing. The idea is, if you want to learn to ride a bike, you practice, don't you? You do it again and again so that you get the right things in place, so that you know exactly what you've got to do to ride your bike. And then in the end, as I say, you get on the bike and you ride your bike and you don't necessarily think about it. It's a bit like adults, isn't it, when you learn to drive a car. First of all, you get in the car and you've got no idea. I've got these pedals. I've got this wheel. What do I do? How do I use the indicator? What am I going to do? Do I put the clutch in? And you have lessons and you practice and you practice. And eventually you can learn to drive a car 
and it becomes, I was going to say you can do it without thinking, but you obviously need due care and attention. But I think you know what I mean when I say you can get into a car and you can drive a car without thinking. You don't think, oh, clutching, oh, you just do it. You change gear or whatever and you do it. It becomes like second nature to you. You can do things, as I say, thinking about it. And that is the sort of thing that we need to be thinking about in our life as we walk through our life with God. Chaz is going to be talking about how we are blessed, things that we need to think about that need to be ingrained into our lives, that we do day by day, hour by hour, so that in the end, they're like second nature to us, so that we live a godly life without purposely having to think about, is that the right thing? Is that the wrong thing? Should I do that? Shouldn't I? You just automatically know this is the path that I should be following. And the only way we can do that is like when we learn to ride a bike or drive a car. We need to be putting the right things into practice every day so that in the end it's our second nature. And the only way as well that we can do that is through the grace of God. He sends his spirit to transform us, to help us keep on with that practice day by day. So when we fall off of our bike, when we take the wrong path, so to speak, God can pick us up. He can put us back onto that saddle and he can guide us. It's like he's holding the back of the saddle. He can guide us in what we are doing. But that doesn't mean to say that God's grace is there all the time when you deliberately know that you're taking the wrong path. Because God is a God of justice and of love. And he hates sin, mainly because he knows what it does to us, because he wants us to have that perfect life. So that is why the Holy Spirit is with us. The Holy Spirit is that guiding hand on the saddle, if you like, or on the steering wheel, helping you to know exactly what you should do. So that every day that you follow Jesus, you are looking straight ahead. You know the right path to follow. So next time you get on your bikes and you're pedalling along, just try and think, I've learned to do this because I have practised and practised. And think about what you need to do, what you need to put into practice so that you can follow Jesus. You can follow the right path. OK. Right. We're going to sing a song that's got actions to it. So if those of you that feel in energetic and you've got a bit of room, you can do the actions. We haven't done some action songs for quite a while. We're going to sing. I'm going to jump up and down. Oh, all the adults are going, oh, no, really? Yep, we're going to jump up and down. And if I have to do it at the front, so can you. But the idea is it says we're going to run the race. We're going to follow Jesus and we're not going to stop. So we are not going to stop our practicing, are we? So that we get everything right. Okay. So get yourselves ready. Get limbered up. We're going to jump up and down.
have made you all nice and warmed up now. <laughs> Especially with the heating on as well. You'll be there, oh, it's really hot in here. <laughs> right, okay. Our young folk are going to go out to their Sunday school groups and classes. So as our young folk leave us, we are going to sing Holy Spirit, you are welcome here before Chaz comes to bring God's word. And we want to invite the Holy Spirit to make us open to all that God wants to say to us through the words that Chaz brings. We've already mentioned that it's the Holy Spirit that transforms our lives. And so let's just settle our hearts and minds as we sing, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Let us 
experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence. Lord God, as we invite your Holy Spirit to flood this place, Lord God, would your Holy Spirit flow through us, make us vessels that are open in hearts and minds to what you want to say to us. Father God, we thank you for the thoughts that you have placed on Chazzy's heart for the thoughts that he, is gonna, that he is going to bring this morning. Help us, Lord, to be open to learn more of what you want to say to each one of us. Holy Spirit, come. Flood this place. Change this atmosphere. Lord God, help us to be thirsty and on fire for you and for your word. Amen. Please be seated. Chaz. Real privilege to be able to take my mask off <laughs> in church. So I'll need to put the glasses on to read. The scripture this morning is uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12, which are the Beatitudes. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. When people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Beatitudes set out guidance of what every disciple should seek to follow. They're not the law, and in these last two years, we've all become familiar with the difference between law and guidance. Here, Jesus is for living so that things may go well for us 
and we will be blessed. This guy does not ever sit well with the expectations. Much like the opposite. For disciples, there's no room for pride, power, or aggression. And we should show timidity in the face of aggression. Also, it's not optional for a disciple of Jesus to think that because one or two of these Beatitudes applies to us, that we will be really blessed. Every one of them are aspirations we should seek to meet because Jesus did. Today's topic was given the title of just one of the Beatitudes, the fourth one. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I was not really sure why, but as I studied the topic, I came to realize that if we do look closely at this one verse, we can begin to grasp the essence of what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples. They'd been used to religious leaders telling them to do this or do that or don't do this or don't do that. The book of Deuteronomy has a very expansive list of such rules. And the Jews believed that obeying these rules would be righteous. Later on in chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus tells the disciples that unless their righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. How could these first disciples and us possibly hope to meet that standard? With such a long list of rules, you will eventually trip up and therefore fail. Not a problem, said the teachers of the law. Bring a money-making sacrifice to the temple and you can be forgiven. Lest we get, feel too smug about the Jewish leaders, this is very like the Christian church was before the Reformation with its indulgence payments, which only the rich could afford to cover their, supposedly cover their sins. The power of human desires and temptations, which we'll come to later, is always there to lead us away from God. The Jewish people always struggle with this, repenting and coming back to God and then turning away again. In their ultimate distress, God, looking forward to the time of Jesus, says in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. The Beatitudes embody that promise. They show how we should live if we have God's law in our hearts and our minds. They're the path which Jesus said would bless the first disciples and will therefore bless us. If we met all of them, we would show our love for God, the creator, and for our neighbor, which Jesus also said were the two real commandments. They're not a list of things to do or not do. Then they are motivations. Except arguably this fourth one, which does instruct us to do something. The others expect us to be something as disciples. So breaking down this one verse, firstly, what is the righteousness we should be hungry and thirsting for, which must be greater than that of the Pharisees? Back in the autumn, Laurie spoke about righteousness, and in his summary, he correctly said that the law could not make anybody righteous as we will always fall short. But he stressed that once we have faith in Jesus, the law does remain useful to point us in the right direction. But when it comes to being righteous, the law is only a basic framework. And Jesus in this teaching in the Beatitudes takes it much further. A key part of the construction of the word Beatitudes is the word attitude. 
Our attitudes are formed from what is in our minds and hearts. And as Christians, we all know that Jesus' teaching was about the heart. Jesus explains that it's no good not murdering someone if in your heart you wish that you had done it. Or not committing adultery if you spend your time lusting after another man or woman. If such attitudes are what is in our hearts, then we are definitely not following the Lord's teaching. It's worth noting that it's not easy for us to change our attitudes as they've probably been largely formed by the world. So Paul tells us in Romans 12, chapter 12, verse 2, do not conform to the pattern <clears throat> of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's perfect will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul tells us that we need to be transformed. Industrial psychologists who work to change attitudes in organizations start work from a premise that you cannot change attitudes and that it is no use just pleading with people to do things differently. Instead, they start by changing behaviors in the workplace. Their philosophy is that our attitudes will gradually change and come into line with our behavior because we cannot stand the dissonance in our lives. A simple everyday example of this is how we acquire a taste for something new. The more we eat or drink something, we eventually come to like it. As Christians, however, we should have a very different view on this. We believe that God working through the Holy Spirit can bring about the change in us, transform us. And as we read about the conversion of the Apostle Paul, God can in extreme cases do it almost in an instant. If God working through the Holy Spirit has changed our hearts, Paul says we will know internally what is righteous and what is not and know what to do in every situation. No amount of head knowledge based on written rules can do this. So Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Who, as I've already said, is the first one which arguably promises something positive in this world. The first three could be seen as negative in worldly terms. Poor in spirit, mourning, and meekness. But in this fourth beatitude, there's a promise of fulfillment. Taking it literally, it would be that nice, warm, contented feeling after a good meal when we feel filled and relaxed and all the more satisfying if we've been really hungry before. <clears throat> the promise Jesus is making is that we will feel blessed if we hunger and thirst after righteousness and will feel satisfied but surely the text means we should have a real hunger and thirst for righteousness. Otherwise, Jesus might have said, blessed are those who seek righteousness. The verse is much more emotive than that. The Sermon on the Mount comes early in Jesus' ministry after he'd been in the desert for 40 days and nights, 
hunger and thirst was something he knew acutely. His audience living in the Middle East would also know what this meant, perhaps a little better than we do in this country. So let's take the concept of hunger and thirst a little further by considering how we, as humans, hunger and thirst after other things. Things which the Bible tells us are not righteous. The things that Jesus goes on to preach against that are the cause of so much misery and pain in this world. The things that our human nature can so easily desire, if we're honest and look back in our lives, wouldn't we all have to admit that some of the strongest desires and emotions we've experienced were for things that are questionable as being righteous? Pride in our and our loved ones' achievements. And perhaps even pushing the boundaries to accomplish them. Not the poverty of spirit that Jesus speaks about. Desire to own material things that most of the world cannot even dream about. Sexual lust, overindulgence in the wonderful things we have to off we have on offer to eat and drink. The world out there nowadays has the means that were unimaginable to Jesus' audience to lure us away from God's righteousness and therefore a blessing. The Beatitudes, however, still hold the key to a satisfied human life today, just as they did 2,000 years ago. Jesus later in his sermon goes on to warn about this and expounds what sexual sin and hatred and revenge really are, not the narrow definition in the commandments like the act of murder, unlawful sex and greed. These we can rightly judge as wrong. But where these things start is in our hearts. There they can grow until some people commit the very serious acts that ruin other people's lives as well as our own. Jesus tells that we need to aspire to seek God's righteousness with the same passion that we have for things that delight our earthly bodies. In John's gospel, in his final words to his disciples, Jesus tells them that the world is their enemy, even though he also directs them into mission to save people from it. The Bible is the guide to God's righteousness, and it does not change. It never has, and it never will. Regardless of what our lawmakers believe, and last week, Sylvia called us back to keep in scripture in our lives. In Matthew 6, verse 33, Jesus talks about the things we need that the pagans run after and says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Why is it God's righteousness we should seek? It's his universe, and what he has decided is righteous is what we need to accept as right. It's not negotiable. It's unchanging, and it does not matter whether it fits with our or the current worldview. It is what Jesus tells us we are to seek. In the eight Beatitudes and the verses which follow, where Jesus explains more about what we're trying, we are to try to emulate, he sets out clearly what every one of us is to aspire to, not in our own strength, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. This righteousness is obviously what it would be like in the new heaven and the new earth. And won't that be truly wonderful? No evil, just righteousness. No six o'clock bad news every day for eternity. Jesus was, however, talking to his disciples about the here and now, not just the world to come, and says that if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we will be filled. 
Jesus knew what it was as a human being to submit to God's righteousness when he wandered along to the Jordan and allowed John to baptize him. As we've heard already in this series, John declined at first, knowing who Jesus was. But in Matthew 3, verse 15, Jesus said, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Now, we believe Jesus had no need to be baptized, unlike us. But he was not too proud to do what was right before his heavenly father. And in response, the father spoke and said, with him, I am well pleased. If he'd not done so, would we now be called Melbourne Baptist Church? Baptism is not optional. And I know personally how much I railed against it. I was a member here for nearly 20 years before I was baptized. Why? Because I maintained that I'd been christened as a baby and had been confirmed at 14. But one evening when I was leading worship, I just knew God was saying to me, it was not enough. I confessed that evening to the church that I needed to be baptized. And Rachel Dixon, who was singing with me, followed and said she also needs to be baptized. Look what God's done in ministry through Rachel. If you've not been baptized, you really need to seek God about this. Of course, if I'd still been disobedient, I would not be a deacon and I would not be stuck with a treasurer's job. <laughs> but then again, prayers might not have been answered for my eyesight so that I, I can actually continue to be a treasure. Looking deeper at this righteousness, we need to aspire to, drawing from the rest of Jesus' sermon, which I suggest read some scripture, go home and read the rest of the chapter. He tells the disciples they need to be more righteous than the Pharisees. And we can see how tough the, um, that teaching is. I'll just quote one of, of these. There's a whole uh, section of verses there. In verses 38 to 42, as for revenge, we should not poke out an eye because one of ours was poked out, but we should turn the other cheek and return good for evil. Now, I'm sure Jesus must have got a laugh for that, you know. <laughs> He was, uh, he was an orator, wasn't he? Uh, so Jesus sets out some very tough teaching. But it's interesting that when he'd finished, the Bible records that the crowds were amazed because he taught as one who had authority. We believe, of course, that he had ultimate authority. But we must be careful when we read the Beatitudes, to only judge ourselves against the teaching and not other people, lest we fall under the same condemnation that Jesus used against the teachers of the law, left for us to follow. There's a tendency nowadays to talk of God only as a loving God. And David shared last week about the width and the depth of that love. We even hear some say that because of this, God will forgive everyone and not only those who confess that Jesus is Lord. That, however, is not the teaching of the Bible. In his sermon where Jesus tells his disciple that even they will not enter the kingdom of heaven if their righteousness does not surpass that of the Pharisees. Now, we believe that to gain that righteousness, we need Jesus as our saviour and that God's forgiveness cannot be taken for granted. The Bible shows God's justice as at times being unbelievably harsh with whole nations wiped out to accomplish his purposes. In 1741, Jonathan Edwards, one of the most important preachers of the Great Awakening, 
preached a fire and brimstone sermon entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It's worth reading. You can find it on Google. And it leaves you in no doubt what the preachers of the time thought about God's judgment. Personally, I know my only hope is in Jesus. I can look back over my life and see how much I need forgiveness. But I also believe it's much more difficult today to maintain a sense of what is right and wrong. The modern media and communications devices bombard us with all sorts of alternative views that try to lead us astray. Having a PC for business in the very early days, I joined an online Christian group back in the late 1980s, before the web was really in existence. I soon learned that instead of a group of, and, and I, with this Christian group, I soon learned that instead of a group of like-minded people that wanted to explore God's word, it was subject to nasty people who wanted to rage against those of us that had a faith. I soon left the group and have never been inclined to join online groups since. I realized that they allow anyone to publish their opinions, a privilege that used to be reserved to people who were hopefully more qualified to research and express their opinions, and at least who could be held accountable. Now, many people on these groups are subject to intolerable abuse and filth, and we hear of tragic suicides of young people from it. I believe that such things are a major problem for us in our efforts to follow the teachings of Jesus. They are very powerful distractions. There have always been distractions, but I suspect never more so than today. Other distractions include the pressures on young parents to make the time for their children to experience a plethora of different activities. It was not like this too, not too many years ago. I don't think I even need to mention the anything goes sexual attitudes propounded today. These are the pressures of the world to conform to its standards of what it says is right and what it wants us to do. And as I've already said, Jesus was quite explicit to his disciples that the world is their enemy. And I'll be talking more about this the next time I speak. So let's remember we should not unthinkingly conform to the world. Jesus said it hated him first and it does not want us to believe in him. It may be my age, but I also have to say that I've also lost a lot of faith in news outlets, and I now scan several of them to try to get a balanced view of the world out there. This sadly includes the BBC, or the British Broadcaster of Calamities, as I refer to them. What did hoarding toilet rolls have to do with COVID? Yet a video clip of an old lady pushing a trolley full of them was sufficient to empty the supermarket shelves. There never was a fuel shortage until they convinced half the population to go and fill up their tanks, which were usually nearly empty. There was no shortage of turkeys or Christmas presents. What this illustrates is the power of the media to influence what people believe and therefore act upon. And this power is largely in the hands of people who do not follow God's agenda. God loves the world, but he hates the sin that harms the ones he loves and ruins his creation. He had to sacrifice his son to redeem it. And Jesus claims he is the only way to righteousness with God. This is what we have to hunger and thirst for. And the world's agenda and its distractions make it more difficult for us to do this. 
And I was listening to the Sunday program today, and they were talking about um, technology moving on and what it might be like in the future. And I guess the only comment on that is you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, it will get worse. So the remaining question posed by this fourth beatitude is this. If we do strive to attain this righteousness, will we really feel blessed and filled in this life and not just life to come? I know some of you may say it's easy for me to say, yes, I feel filled, as I've been so incredibly blessed in this life. And I recognize that this is not the case for many. However, when I'm together with my family, all sat around the table enjoying a meal together, which we do regularly, I often reflect that the only things that really matter to me are the love we share between us and my faith in Jesus which is how I believe I show my love to God. Now, what I'm not saying is that only Christians can be good. We all know many people who are nice, who do not confess Jesus as Lord. And I know I'm not the only alone in rejoicing in this love of family. Someone I really respect is Warren Buffett the financier and one of the richest men in the world. He's still working at 91 years old. And he was asked a few years ago by a young business student on a video I saw, what do you consider success? His reply was, when you get to my age, if those who ought to love you do so, then that is success. I suspect the answer she was looking for was how many millions you have to make to be successful. Warren Buffett still lives in the same house he bought with his wife in the 1950s. And he was driving a hail-damaged car just a few years ago. He's pledged to give away over 90% of his billions of dollars through philanthropy. So I'm sure you'll agree he appears to be a good man and does righteous things. But sadly, in my opinion, although he was brought up as a Presbyterian and seems to follow much of Jesus' teaching, he now says that he's agnostic. Jesus' words in the Beatitudes speak truth to the world about how to live, and many people follow this teaching. It's my contention, however, that the rewards of this life alone, however fabulous a hand it might give you, are not enough to be totally filled. I believe you can only be so through following Jesus' teachings and believing in him and therefore attaining God's righteousness. So for me, I say the answer, the final question is yes, we can be filled in this earthly life by hungering and thirsting for God's righteousness and not in any small part because I believe there's a much better life to come and that I will be privileged to be there, but only because of what Jesus did for me. Thank you, Chess. I think you'll agree there. Uh, there's quite a lot in there for us to go away and think about and as Chaz said continue reading that chapter in scripture quite challenging as well when you read that and as Chaz touched on a lot of it most of it we can't do in our any of it we can't do in our own strength it's through the strength that we are given through the Holy Spirit being placed in us and so that's the thing that we're going to just pick up on briefly as our response. Because we're going to sing a couple of songs that just invite the Holy Spirit, before we invited the Holy Spirit to be in this place. Now we're going to sing a couple of songs that are asking the Holy Spirit to actually come and dwell in us and flow through us. For some, when we sing the second song, 
It's asking the Holy Spirit to fall afresh on us. For some people, it may be that they're asking for the Holy Spirit to fall on them for the first time. It may just be that it needs to fall afresh because we've taken it for granted. And we don't actually stop and think that the things we need to do are achievable through Christ's strength and the Holy Spirit. So if you'd like to stand as we sing these couple of songs, I invite you to. Others of you may feel that you just want to remain seated as you think about these words, as you invite the Holy Spirit to dwell in you and through you. Let's sing, Is Anyone Thirsty? living water, that Holy Spirit, to flow through us. But before it can, maybe we just need to acknowledge that we need to be living in that spirit, but it needs to fall on us afresh. We need to, as I say, acknowledge that we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and upon our lives. 
the Holy Spirit that is all transforming, that gives us that strength to strive to be the righteous people that God wants us to be, to live those righteous lives and to not conform to the world, as Chaz has mentioned, but to live in that righteous, just way. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. just ask the Holy Spirit to fall afresh on us. Father God, we just thank you for the cleansing power of your Holy Spirit that you can, when invited, flow through us like a mighty river. Lord God, when we think of a 
a mighty big river as it tumbles along. Lord God, may we think of the power that can flow through us. And Father God, may we use that power, your Holy Spirit, that flows through us. Lord God, may we use that to help further your kingdom here on earth. Lord God, may we be the salt and the light that you call us to be. So that as Chaz said, when we turn on the news, it always seems to be heartbreaking. It seems to be that we feel that there is no way forward. Lord God, may you help us to shine your light into the darkened world, to show people that there is a hope, that there is a light. If only people would put their faith in you. Amen. As we bring our time of fellowship together to a close, we're going to sing, Come Set Your Rule and Reign. Picks up on the fact that we hunger, we thirst. We want to live the lives that we have been called to live. We want the atmosphere to be changed. We are God's people. Come set your rule and reign. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray.
Let's say this blessing together. Have we got the blessing to come up? Sorry? <laughs> Doesn't look like it wants to play ball, does it? Okay, I will read this blessing. Then. Lord God, give us a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Make our hearts pure so that they may be filled with love, overflowing with mercy. By the transforming power of your Holy Spirit, may our lives reflect your glory so that others may come to see and know you in their, in their lives. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Amen.